Well, here I captured the video from going through the slideshow, but the audio didn't record. So I'm going to have to voice over and try to guess what I was saying as I went through this. If you lip read, you'll see it won't match. I was reviewing what we went over on Friday. Here I was talking about enthalpy, which is a state function designed so that the change in enthalpy along a path that's at constant pressure gives you the heat absorbed by the system. One of the uses of this state function is that enthalpy values for given reactions can be tabulated and then used to calculate energy values. So for instance here we have a tabulated enthalpy for the combustion of methane which releases 890 kilojoules per mole. So given that we can calculate how much heat is released when you combust 5.8 grams. That's just a matter of a proportionality calculation that 5.8 grams is what fraction of one mole? Well then the heat release is going to be that same fraction of the center enthalpy of the minus 890 kilojoules. Here I gave you a theoretical justification of why this works, why enthalpy really is a state function, and why the change in this state function gives you the heat absorbed in a constant pressure pathway. And that was the end of Friday's slideshow. Today we picked up on where that left off with the discussion of Hess's law. Hess's law tells us that from given reactants in a particular state to given products in a particular state, the enthalpy change is always going to be the same along all pathways of getting there. Which makes sense because enthalpy is a state function, so this is kind of necessary. One of the nice things about it is that the pathway doesn't have to be a single pathway, it can be a series of different chemical reactions. So we're showing a series of chemical reaction steps. Well, so what's the point? The point is that we can use this to calculate energy changes, enthalpy changes, and heat flows for reactions that we haven't done and we can know how the energetics is going to come out as long as we can find a series of steps that have been figured out. And it turns out that a lot of these have been figured out and there are a lot of standard enthalpies that are tabulated which we can use for our calculations. Here's an example. Carbon has two common solid forms at room temperature, graphite and diamond. Graphite's the stuff in your pencil leads, you know what diamond is. What we're going to do here is calculate the heat absorbed when graphite changes into diamond. We can't do that reaction directly. What we are going to do is calculate what that energetics would be from the known enthalpies of combustion. So yes, that means that someone has taken graphite, burned it, measured how much energy is absorbed, and also taken diamond, burned it, and measured how much energy is absorbed. I'm not going to recommend that you burn diamond, but it can happen. So we see here that minus 394 kilojoules per mole of heat is absorbed when graphite burns. Well, since that's a negative number being absorbed, that means that heat is released. Similarly, minus 396 kilojoules of heat is absorbed when diamond is burned. That means that 396 kilojoules is released. Uh, that's a little bit more than with graphite, so diamond burns a little bit hotter than graphite. I don't recommend that you burn diamond in the winter to keep yourself warm, though. Well, here's how we can use these two measured combustion reactions to tell us about the reaction changing from graphite to diamond. So here I've got the combustion reaction for graphite on the top line, and then the negative of the combustion reaction for diamond on the bottom line. So this is showing carbon dioxide decomposing into diamond and oxygen. Also an unlikely reaction, but we know that the heat absorbed is going to be just the heat released in the combustion reaction. Now you notice if we add these reactions together, uh, the carbon graphite plus oxygen goes to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide cancels out on both sides. The oxygen cancels out on both sides. All that we're left with is the graphite in the reactants and diamond in the products. The reaction enthalpies also add. Here, minus 394 plus 396 gives plus 2 kilojoules per mole. So if graphite changes into diamond, it would absorb 2 kilojoules per mole of carbon that this is happening to. 
So this gave an example of finding the heat of reaction based on two combustion reactions. And it turns out that it's easy to measure the enthalpies of combustion or the enthalpy changes of combustion. You just burn something in a calorimeter and see how much heat is evolved. Then we can cleverly combine those reactions to give us the enthalpies of other reactions that we might be more interested in. Another cute trick that we use to determine arbitrary reaction enthalpies is to define all elements in their standard states as zero. From that, we can determine extremely useful enthalpies, which are enthalpies of formation. That's the heat absorbed when a compound is created from its elements. So we can use combustion reactions to calculate standard enthalpies of formation, and then enthalpies of formation are extremely useful for determining the enthalpies of pretty much arbitrarily any other kind of reaction. Back to talking about the standard states of elements. The standard state of an element is its stabilist form at 0 C and 1 atmosphere pressure, or sometimes at 25 C room temperature and 1 atmosphere pressure. Notice here I don't have the degree sign on the degrees Celsius because the degree sign looks terrible in the fonts that I have access to. Back to standard states. For the elements hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, the standard state is the diatomic molecules H2, N2, O2, F2, Cl2, Br2, I2. For the element carbon, the standard state is graphite. Diamond is a slightly higher in energy. Phosphorus is an exception. The stabilist form of phosphorus is not the standard state. The standard state of phosphorus is white phosphorus, which is the molecule P4. It's not as stable as red phosphorus or black phosphorus, but there you have it. White phosphorus is the stuff that ignites on exposure to air. That's the stuff that Hennig brand made by boiling buckets and buckets and buckets of urine. Now I'd like to give you an example of how we can use enthalpies of combustion to find enthalpies of formation. In this particular case, we'll find the enthalpy of formation of methane CH4. So here we have the enthalpies of combustion of three substances, methane, carbon, and hydrogen. Here in the case of hydrogen, I've listed the heat of combustion of two moles of hydrogen because we're going to need two moles here. So this is actually twice the standard molar enthalpy of combustion of hydrogen. First, I'm going to write down the data that we had from the slide so that it's in front of us. Now I've written that so it looks like a 672 kilojoules per mole, but it's not. It's 572. So now let me show you what we can do with these. Now I'm going to rewrite these equations in such a way that they add up to give the equation that's the formation of methane from its elements. Post the enthalpy changes with their reactions with the proper signs to reflect the direction that the reactions are listed here. Oops, forgot the oxygen on this side of the reverse combustion reaction. Let's put that in. Then we add it all up. Now we can get rid of the chemical substances that appear in the same way on both sides of the equation. On both sides we have CO2, we have 2H2O, and we have 2O2. Those can come out of both sides. And then what's left is 2H2 plus C gives you CH4. Adding up the energies, and for the result, we get minus 75 kilojoules per mole, which means that it's exothermic to create methane from the elements carbon and hydrogen. And in fact, that's the value that you'll get if you look up the standard enthalpy of formation of methane. And this is how you get it. See? And here's how I can use standard enthalpies of formation to find enthalpies of reaction. In this particular case, it'll be the reaction between two moles of ethanol, that's the C2H5OH, to give one mole of diethyl ether, that's the C2H5 twice O, plus one mole of water. So here are the standard enthalpies of formation of all the substances in the reaction. On the top, the diethyl ether, then the ethanol, then the water. I'm just going to number these species, the ethanol, the diethyl ether, and the water, one, two, and three, so that we know what I'm talking about. The enthalpy of the reaction 
is just going to be the sums of the enthalpies of the products in the reaction minus the enthalpies of the reactants. So here we add together the enthalpies of diethyl ether and water and subtract from it the enthalpy of two moles of diethyl ether. And when the dust settles, it's positive 16.74 kilojoules per mole. So making diethyl ether from two moles of ethanol is slightly endothermic.